start with the uh, first talk of the day. We have Ed Cable, a <coughs> new introduction. Everybody knows Ed uh, from Mifos, uh, founder of Mifos and, and CEO. And he's going to talk about us uh, unbundling the core. So. OK, so, thank, you, thank you, Javier. All right, thanks everyone. So I think this is going to be a pretty interesting topic, and I've got 68 slides to cover, so I'm going to get going right now. OK, so most of you from our community know me, but my name is Ed Cable. I oversee the MIFOS initiative, but I'm also part of the Baseflow team as well, and a member of the Finerac PMC. And when I'm not working on our community, I've got a menagerie of animals in Northern California help to take care of. Three dogs you can see up top, a rabbit, some goats, and chickens. That's Mochi in the corner there. OK, so in terms of what we're going to hope to cover today, first off, just want to establish why this topic about unbundling the core is so important, then going to define what that core banking system is and the boundaries of it. And then we're going to take a closer look at the different components in the Finerac core. And then we're going to look more closely at what is beyond the core, all the different solutions that need to be deployed for a full end-to-end -end fintech or banking solution. And then we're also going to look into some rules of engagement and playbooks for being successful and contributing back upstream. And then lastly, we'll recap in some actionable steps you can take to help with our mission. So first off, just wanted to talk a teeny bit about Mifos just to establish that we're in a pretty unique position here where Mifos donated the IP, which became Apache Finerac. And so with IP sitting in Apache, Mifos's main role is to really focus on building out the ecosystem of solution providers that contribute back upstream and also to help act as a gateway to bring new developers into the project. So first off, just wanted to establish more of a definition of what a core banking system is. So I looked what how Gartner defined it, how ChatGPT defined it, Ishvan will like that. And then there's also a good article on FinTech Futures where they actually let me know of a little known fact I wasn't aware of that core actually stands for a centralized online real-time exchange. But essentially, you know, the core banking system is a back office system that processes all the daily transactions, handles the management of the customer and various banking accounts, whether that's lending, savings, equity, et cetera, and then the underlying general ledger accounting and reporting to administer all that. But we'll talk more about the core itself, so I'll just quickly go over that. And then this is a take on the magic quadrant, but with some dimensions that help to position Finerac well. But on the vertical axis here, it's around cost effectiveness. And then on the horizontal axis here, it's around composability and control. And as you can see here, Finerac is in a class of its own. But in the bottom quadrant here, we have the legacy incumbents. A lot of their stack is quite you know, outdated. It's not as flexible or as adaptable as it should be. And it's definitely high cost, as we saw in some of the sessions yesterday. And then there is a new category of core banking system providers. They do leverage the cloud. They do leverage microservices, composable architectures. I call them the modern upstarts. And so they do offer a good degree of control and flexibility, but they are still quite expensive. And then I didn't have many logos of just small solutions, but in that top left-hand quadrant are more just homegrown solutions that don't scale well, but they could be cost effective. But Finerac sits on its own, as we've seen from some of the presentations yesterday, in terms of being highly adaptable, highly extensible, highly composable, highly scalable, but also you know, very cost effective and a great growth engine for financial services. And then one other piece of context I wanted to establish just before we define the boundaries of the core system is a little bit of background of how Finerac's evolved. So this will come out on the next slide about why this is important. So Finerac started out more as just an application, but we've become a platform over time. So the origins of Finerac were Mifos and what James started around just an MIS, or Management Information System for Microfinance. But now we've evolved for many use cases beyond that. So financial inclusion more broadly, but also government sectors around GDP payments. And then we've got a wide range of use cases for banks and neobanks modernizing their core systems. And then there's a tremendous amount of adoption amongst the fintech and embedded finance space amongst a variety of use cases. And just real quick, you know, to show how that evolution has evolved, first round was around microfinance and financial inclusion, then more adoption around individual banks and individual fintechs. And now we're seeing a lot of adoption where 
infrastructure as a service layers are being built on top of the open source system. And so just wanted to bring, bring to bear these points because it's important to set the stage about why this conversation is important around how we define the core boundaries and what sits around it. And so, yeah, this is just a slide with a number of logos showing, you know, it's a good example of highlighting the different use cases. So whether it's a core banking system for an MFI or a SOC or a financial institution serving the base of the pyramid, an enterprise bank, a wallet or payment provider, or on the FinTech side, a lot of lending providers. These are a variety of the companies that use Finract and some of the use cases that it supports. And so now that you've seen sort of where Finract has come from in terms of starting out as an application and evolving to be a platform, I want to speak to why this is so important for the session and why this topic of how we establish what the boundary of the core system is, what sits around it, and then how there's our incentives to contribute upstream to the core, but there's still a broad enough playing field that others can differentiate and commercialize around the core itself. And so this is important because one, you know, this impacts everybody in our community, whether it's the users of the software, the companies implementing it or building new solutions, those who are just, you know, building new features or those who are maintaining it, as well as our community gardeners and those who are helping to encourage upstream contribution. And so this topic of how we establish these boundaries will help to guide our roadmap, it'll help to influence our architecture, but most importantly, it helps to guide the rules of engagement for our community and ecosystem. And so, as you've seen, we're quite unique for Apache in terms of we have like a enterprise level user facing application. I think Javier and others, you know, touched on how we're not just some type of infrastructure or library that gets embedded in a solution. And as these use cases have evolved over time, we have a pretty, you know, distinct dynamic between small users of the platform and larger users of the platform. And this is a, you know, key tension that gets brought to bear when we talk about these boundaries. So small institutions are looking for a turnkey solution where everything's all in one, and then many of the more enterprise or larger institutions want a more unbundled solution where they build out more around the core itself, and we'll dive into that soon. And then lastly, around the ecosystem, why this is important is a key part of our mission around reaching the three billion under bank is creating a virtuous cycle where we have a large amount of upstream contributions to the core. So we need to continue to incentivize these contributions and one of the ways in which to do that is to demonstrate that around the core, there's a large you know, set of opportunities in which to commercialize and differentiate. So we want to create this culture of co-opetition. So. so let me take you back in time a little bit to one of the pen relays at Franklin Field. So Franklin Field is a stadium at my alma mater, University of Pennsylvania. So it was built in 1895, and that pen relay started in 1895 as well. But I wanted to use like this metaphor of a stadium. It's not the most accurate metaphor, but it'll fit the most of like the context of boundaries today. So I just want to talk a little bit around the boundary of the common upstream code base, which would be the central field here. And then around the track area would be more of the ancillary solutions and what's beyond the core. And then we want to try to create both a playing field as well as a set of rules and playbooks for the players playing the you know, in the stadium such that we can bring as many attendees to the crowd and as many players to the table in terms of fintechs, financial institutions, others using the software. So we'll get into the details of this shortly, but that's how this eye chart, you know, looks overlaid on top of the playing field and the boundaries we're establishing. So I'll just spend just a quick moment on this because going to dive into each aspect of the core. But this was you know, my initial definition of the boundaries of the FINRAC core right now. And so we'll touch upon each of these areas at a pretty high level, but you need to manage the customers and the necessary information to properly identify them. There's a full account management engine and ability to create a variety of products. And then you have the all, all the underlying transaction processing capabilities to support those products. And then you need to be able to integrate and extend the software with other systems. You need to secure you know, access to the system. And then as we touched upon some of the reporting and accounting aspects, and then lastly at the bottom there, some other aspects we'll dive into. And then these are the items and solutions that sit beyond the core that are necessary to layer on top of the core banking system to actually build an end-to-end -end solution for either a FinTech, a financial institution, a neobank, and what have you not. 
but I'll dive into these in more depth later. And then these are how the two, you know, look together. So this is definitely, I think, the eye chart slide of my presentation at the moment. So just in terms of the capabilities of the core, like Robert in his initial presentation on day one, you know, he had a list of some of the components of the key features of Finrac. These are a screenshot of what ChatGPT says are key features, but we talked about these at a high level on the last slide. And now what I want to do now is dive into each of these components and then give a brief, you know, rundown of what that capability is, an assessment of how mature, how scalable, how easy to use, how robust that capability is into Finrac, and then in some cases, you know, recommendations or a roadmap area around that component. So first off around customer management, you know, this involves just management of the customer and the entire life cycle around that, but primarily around properly identifying them, storing the necessary KYC information and whatnot. And so most here are pretty familiar with Finrac, so I won't touch upon this too, too much, but I think one point we'll talk about later on is just whether or not this customer module should stay within Finrac or should it be externalized. And this also goes back to that notion of small customers wanting to have an all-in-one solution versus larger customers. So one key dynamic there is that larger customers will often have multiple banking products, and so they don't want to have to maintain individual customer records within each banking product. So that's why it might make sense to have a separate customer module. And so in terms of the assessment of the Finrac customer management module, it's fairly good overall, but I think at a functional level, we could do more and we'll touch upon that as we talk about some of the other layers beyond the core itself. So as we dive into the products, the most mature and robust module within Finrac is around the lending and credit products. So we touched upon some of this yesterday, but there is a very flexible and robust centralized engine to create a wide range of lending products, whether it's a mortgage loan, auto loan, a buy now, pay later loan, a microfinance loan, an individual loan, small business loan, you name it, Finrac can usually support the lending use case that you're seeking to implement. And then on the lending side, we touched upon a number of the recent advancements that have occurred, but I'll talk a little bit more around some of the key points where there are opportunities, especially around origination and decisioning where we can approve upon what's there at the moment. So. Then the next up is the savings and deposits module. And I think as it came up in another one of the sessions, this is an area where savings, you know, given it wasn't a core part of the microfinance methodology that was initially implemented in Finrac, some of the aspects of savings, especially around uh, scalability on the transactional side, need quite a bit of improvement. But at a functional level, there's a decent amount of functionality in terms of being able to create savings, calculate interest, do term and fixed deposits, support overdrafts, support dormancy tracking, and whatnot. But the key areas and recommendations here for our roadmap and the communities discussing is how we can make it highly scalable to support more of the use case of a transactional wallet or debit account. And so given we work with credit unions, cooperatives, and SACOs, we also have the notion of supporting share accounts, which are essentially equity accounts. And so within Finrac, you can create these share accounts and then define and allocate dividends over time. And these, we also still need to work on scalability, but they're fairly usable and functional for the use case they need to support. And then around transaction processing, this is an area where over the past year, we have greatly strengthened the capabilities of Finrac. And so just in terms of the configurability, we do have a high degree of parameterization around interest calculation methodologies. And then one new feature that's coming out into the platform that our Finrac community, who's in attendance here, will, will like is that we now have fully configurable payment allocation logic, which has been a long time feature that's been requested. So I'd say, you know, Finrac ranks pretty high on all these aspects here. So that's why they've got varying degrees of green bullets on the bottom there. And then around portfolio servicing, I tried to bucket a couple different functional areas here, but this is essentially just servicing the loan accounts and making sure the lo both loan and deposit accounts. So in terms of lending, if somebody's in arrears or past due, being able to track and monitor and take action upon that, or if it's a savings account, if that's gone dormant, making sure you, know, you can take that off the balance sheet and whatnot. So Finrac has a great deal of functionality to support this here in terms of tracking the arrears, provisioning for loan losses, rescheduling loans, and then a couple new features coming out that our community will be happy to know about are configurable delinquency buckets to classify 
loans into different categories based on how many days it's passed through or delinquent. And then we also are supporting flagging of accounts using the data tables. And then we touched upon this in Ishvan's session around the batch processing, so I won't spend a ton of time here, but we've made our batch processing much more scalable, much more configurable, and being able to support transactions in real time. And I think the roadmap recommendations here are we want to refactor the existing jobs we have, and then also have better proper documentation around this. And then next up around the accounting and the ledger, Overall, we're pretty you know, strong here, but mo most often if it's a larger institution, they're going to use an external accounting package. So the main priority within Finneract is being able to fully track the general ledger and chart of accounts, and then just make sure you can map the transactions and automatically have whatever transactions that are occurring on the portfolio accounts go to the general ledger. And so, yeah, I think one new feature that came out recently a uh, customer in Nigeria helped us support is adding accrual support at the savings level for accounting. But this is also a key area where integration with our reliable event framework is critical. And then around integrations and extensibility, you know, Ishvan talked deeply around the reliable event framework that we have implemented this past year. But we also have, you know, everything exposed through RESTful APIs. And then we have web and code hooks, which has enabled the ease of integration with external systems. So overall, you know, Finneract is pretty strong in this regard, as we have been able to integrate tightly into complex enterprise systems at multiple levels. But we do need to improve upon our developer experience and make our documentation more accurate to the stack that's available. And then around reporting, we're so-so on this within Finneract, but once again, this is an area where a lot of institutions will implement this beyond the core, but within Finneract itself, we have a set of basic stretchy HTML reports. We integrate with uh, external engine Pentaho, and then we're implementing recently some more capabilities around dashboards and visualizations around superset, but we'll talk about reporting when we look beyond the core. And then just lastly, this was a catch-all for some of the other areas that couldn't fit nicely in the diagram, but in terms of audit, you know, Finneract helps to generate a good audit log of all the actions that have been taken in the system. And then I put in some of the entity management, organizational management aspects here, and these aren't you know, necessary for a lot of the digital first institutions, but given our origins with microfinance and teller-based institutions, there's the ability to manage offices in that hierarchy. So now that we've had that deeper dive and assessment of the Finneract core itself, wanted to look beyond the core a little bit. And so in terms of the structure of this next portion of the presentation, I'm going to take a quick look at each of these layers and then give some you know, options or alternatives that the community could either integrate with or build upon or you know, integrate into the core itself. So we'll look more closely at customer onboarding, then loan onboarding, then we'll look at some of the customer engagement areas, and I've grouped this into customer support and then the channel, so an omni-channel experience, and then also put some of the output management work here as well. And then there's one key category around money movement, so whether this is connecting to you know, real-time payment systems, connecting to batch-based payment systems, connecting to mobile money, or you know, handling the processing of checks or ATMs. And then also I put in here you know, open banking connections as well but we'll talk a little bit around money movement and how that is an important part of Beyond the Core. And then the last category where we'll touch upon items sits around more analytics and controls. So here we'll talk about reporting, here we'll talk about financial crimes compliance, and here we'll talk about the integration layer as well. So as I noted, for each of these Beyond the Core aspects, wanted to talk about what that component or capability actually is, give some examples. They might be proprietary, they might be open source and then give a recommendation from my perspective of what would be you know, a good strategy approach for the community. And this could either be to build that capability into the core itself, build a separate module, ideally an open source one that's available to the community, or to build or integrate with an existing third-party solution. And then for some of these areas, there will be some impact or insight into the roadmap. But this is really the start of this discussion for a community, so that's why there's not, on many of these slides, the full you know, sort of analysis of how that impacts our roadmap that I wanted to get to. 
So first off around customer management, as I brought up before, you know, a number of entities in the community have already started to externalize tracking the customer record outside of FINRAC. And a lot of that's for the reasons I mentioned before, where you might have, you know, multiple banking plat products that are managed across different platforms. And it's difficult if you're maintaining customer record across each one. So it's good to externalize that. So I think this is a key decision point for our community where we want to ensure, you know, for those entities that need an all-in-one solution, they still can maintain the necessary aspects of the customer record within FINRAC. But if we are going to have more of our community externalizing the management of the customer record, we must, you know, bear in mind like what impact this will have and how the architecture should evolve in which to support that. So just want to note for our community, this should be a key area that we discuss over the course of the coming year. And next up around the customer engagement or customer onboarding is more around just like the, I termed it as the KYC automation engine, but needing a framework to help manage the KYC and customer onboarding flows. So a number of our, you know, implementing entities have built their own solutions. Some have used process orchestration tools in which to do that. And there are some out of the box proprietary tools like Alloy. But one good option we've been exploring and we're in dialogue with the team is around Ballerine. So they've got a good framework to help, you know, manage end to end these flows and processes where you need to verify the identity, you need to capture the KYC information, you need to run the client or business against some type of watch list. So this category is here is more around a framework to help automate these processes. But the key point to note is that even with this framework, it's going to be quite region specific, which components you need to integrate with in terms of a specific watch list, in terms of a specific identity provider. And then next up, I did want to call you know, attention to just digital ID verification and screening. So this is, I think the recommendation definitely here is the approach should be to integrate with whatever the market or segment leader is in this case. So this is going to be quite region specific, both in terms of what ID you're verifying or what list you're screening against. So I think once the community has built some type of automation engine like you saw on the last slide, then they can you know, prioritize identifying which specific ID connectors or screening tools they should integrate with. And then the goal with goal is over time, we can make sure across our community, once these modules or plugins have been built for a specific region, that a partner or an entity can easily distribute or make this available to others in the community. Going back to that incentive to be a part of the upstream and the ability to monetize or commercialize around the core. And then moving beyond the customer onboarding, wanted to talk a little bit about loan onboarding right now. And so Finerac, you know, serves it, the purpose of a loan management system where you've actually approved the customer, you've determined what loan they're eligible for. Finerac does a great job as a loan management system, but most of the aspects around loan origination still sit outside of that core system. And so some of this overlaps with the next slide, but around loan origination, it would be a system to manage more of these processes and flows prior to a loan being approved. And so there actually is a system that Victor made the community aware of called uh, Digify. And they're now proprietary, but they had a version of their loan origination system that's open source. So I do think the community should evaluate that and see if there are modules or aspects of that that could be maintained by the community. And then also on loan origination, I do think we have an opportunity to have better integration with a workflow engine. So I know we already use uh, the Kamunda ZB for process orchestration, but it would good, be good to explore you know, the different use cases where we can use something like knowledge is everything, which incorporates I only just learned during this year's uh, community over code. You know, it has Jules, it has Cogito there, and also the JBP man uh, engine. So I was discussing this with Alex, but I think our community should, you know, look at how we can have tighter integration with some type of workflow, a rules engine, because this is one of those, you know, key features that a lot of the more sophisticated implementers have integrated. And I think at a community level, we could benefit from having that more accessible. And then around loan decisioning and credit scoring, you know, this pretty much always sits outside of the core. And so there are a number of different types of tools here. It could be credit scoring, whether it's rule-based, machine learning based, it's some type of risk assessment or decisioning or integration with a credit bureau or even just enriching data that's outside so you can be ready to score and decision upon that. 
So Mifos, you know, we've had a number of conversations with some providers in market, so those are why there's some you know, solutions recommended there. But in terms of alternative credit scoring and behavioral data, Bijini is a good you know, platform, and we're exploring having some type of plugin with Finneract for that. And then around traditional risk assessment, I put a number of the providers there. And then within our community, we have an entity in South Africa that's built a pretty sophisticated tool where you just upload bank statements and using OCR, it extracts all the data. And then using machine learning makes a decision on what amount of loan the customer is eligible for. And so that's from SoftyDoc. And then there are companies like Entropy who provide data enrichment where they can enrich and categorize the data to have it ready for decisioning. And so I say the main recommendation for our community here is to, you know, in many cases, integrate with whoever those segment leaders are. But I think we also have the opportunity to build open source components out there. And so we have had a couple Summer of Code interns work on a credit scorecard tool. And we're trying to incorporate a federated uh, learning model into that. And then we also have a credit bureau integration model. So I think there's a mix of both opportunity to build modules that are open source for our community here, in addition to integrating with third party ones. And then next up will be around money movement. So I categorized or broke out one aspect around just payment orchestration itself. So this isn't around like the payment rail itself, but more the tool to actually integrate with and handle the sophisticated routing of the movement of value. So think of Finneract as your store of value, but then you need to handle the movement of value. And a payment orchestration tool does a good job of this. And the one that I currently recommend for the Finneract community is selfishly one that you know, Ishvan noted that Mifos has helped to develop and maintain with support from the Gates Foundation. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it provides the capabilities to not just orchestrate payments, but other different processes and flows. And so I put a couple other alternatives there. But here, you know, we would want to have an orchestration tool that the community uses, and then they can integrate with the respective payment rails in their country. And that brings us up to payment rails here. So we've seen a good variety of use cases across the community and ecosystem in terms of integrating with more account-to-account -account systems, whether that's real-time payments, instant payments, batch-based payments. And then there's also been some innovation around central bank digital currencies too. And then given you know, our roots in microfinance and financial inclusion, a large number of integrations with mobile money providers and other you know, pan-African or cross-border remittance companies. But once again here, I think the recommendations will be pretty specific to the region you're working with. But we try to you know, make sure we can align with ISO 222 standards. And our goal at the community level is to ideally have like a library of reference connectors that are available out there. And then we also have a library of reference BPMN diagrams, which within our orchestration tool are executable. But these can help to map to the different <coughs> use cases and flows. And so many of our neobanks and fintechs, there still are needing to provide cards. So another key solution beyond the core is around card management, issuing, and processing. And put some of the familiar names here. But once again, I think the key you know, recommendation for the community here is to integrate this capability. I think one of our providers tried to build some of the capability into their solution but it's not something that they shared upstream. So I'd say integrate with whoever the market leader is within your, your region. But we do have one a FinTech within our ecosystem that has some card management capabilities, and that's M2P, so I put them on the slide. And then moving beyond money movement, I'm going to talk a little bit around customer engagement and customer support. So I lumped a number of different tooling under customer support here. So this could be more around CRM and help desk, chat and messaging, notifications to the customer, or chat bots. And so I put some suggestions of tools here, but mainly I wanted to highlight you know, some of the progress across the community in this regard. So some of our interns have worked on integration and embedding Rocket Chat into some of our mobile apps so you could have that chat capability. And then Alex recently mentored one of our Google Summer of Code interns working on a chat bot for Finneract where users could you know, interact and access data or apply for loans, et cetera, through a chatbot. And then we currently have a notifications system within uh, Finneract, but some of our partners and community have been externalizing that as well. But I think the recommendation here is, in some cases, we can build new open source modules, but sometimes we'll just want to integrate with best-in-breed solutions. And I think especially around 
CRM and help desk, we should you know, be integrating because as we move towards more digital first adoption of our platform, a lot of those capabilities aren't there at all within Finerac to you know, have customer support tickets and be able to respond to that. And then next up, it's a pretty big category, but I put omni-channel here. So this is also a use case which you know, the original design of Mifos and Finerac didn't cater to, but many of our adopters now have customer-facing applications, whether they're mobile wallets or, as James you know, noted, self-service applications like mobile or online banking. So right now, you know, the community is trying to explore how we can deprecate and create a more secure alternative to our current self-service APIs. But beyond you know, that at the user management and authentication authorization level, we try to, or Mifos at least, we try to maintain a set of reference mobile applications, which can at least serve for demonstrations, but also help to you know, showcase what digital experiences can be built out. But the key takeaways here are, you know, we want to establish what a best practice is in terms of using an API gateway, you know, having some tooling for secure user management and your proper authentication and authorization, and then, you know, having a proper backend for your channel app and then building the channel app itself. But this is a big area of, you know, exploration for a community, but it's often where the community has the opportunity to differentiate. And then this is a big category where I probably could spend a bit more time on, but around financial crimes compliance and fraud and risk monitoring. I think the main takeaway here is, you know, we're not going to build this capability within Finteract, and we should, you know, integrate with the best in breed solutions here. And there are some open source solutions out there on the market that we've been exploring. One of them is, you know, Lextigo or the fraud, it's developed now by the Fraud and Risk Management Center of Excellence, but this originated out of the Gates Foundation as well. But this category includes, you know, the screening against various lists for counterfinancing of terrorism, anti-money laundering, OFAC, et cetera, but also the real-time transaction monitoring to detect fraud, which is ever more important as real-time payments become more widely adopted. And so in terms of architectural recommendations, given, you know, this is sort of planting the seeds of the discussion for the community, these aren't as well-baked as I would have liked them, but I did have a good conversation with Alex in this regard. And so right now, you know, the near-term path of how we can support this within Finteract is we do have, you know, a good setup and approach around custom modules, and we can continue to utilize this. And then when we had to externalize our reporting through Pentaho, we have a ability to just drop in a jar file as more like a plugin. And so that's a pattern that Alex said we could continue to follow. But I do think our community should continue to explore what a more plugin-like architecture looks like. So ideally, you know, we can make these modules that get built easily discoverable, easily distributable, and easily deployable. And so Alex had suggested that we could have some type of centralized Maven repository in which to do that. But ideally, at some point, we can have a marketplace or app store of sorts where the commercial providers that build XYZ integrations or modules can make those easily discoverable and then deployable onto the various Finerac user base. And then I put a little bit here around process orchestration. So this is just a diagram I think was on previous slides around our payment hub. And this is our orchestration engine for payments, but it provides a centralized microservice workflow engine powered by Komunda ZB engine. And then you build various workers or connectors for your payment systems, your banking channels, or your core banking system. And then you just define your BPMN diagrams which actually execute these flows. And I do think this could be a good alternative for our community in terms of integrating with these external systems. Because one of our competitors, Mambu, who's worth 2.1, I think, billion dollars, and they have a you know, pretty wide user base, and they actually built their solution on an earlier version of Finerac. Their key area of how they you know, integrate with external solutions is their process orchestrator, which is powered by Corzoid, and it's similar concept here where you define the, the flows and then execute the flows and transactions across the various systems. And I know Victor here in the room has used Kamunda and ZB to handle some of the KYC and customer onboarding flows beyond just payments. And so next up, I do have time, so I have a number of like really, really high level case studies just to sort of take a look at the eye chart around the boundary of the core and then how a number of different institutions have implemented that in practice. So one, the first use case is gonna be more so around like the enterprise customer that 
Mihai uh, gave a presentation on yesterday. The next would be around a neobank. And then the third would be around like a small SACO or microfinance institution to sort of see that tension between using everything in the core versus externalizing beyond it. So once again, that's the boundaries of the core system. And then this is the enterprise customer, which we codenamed the pepper soup project. But the boxes highlighted in green you know, denote the areas of the core system that they utilize. And so this customer was only using lending. But this shows how they got a good amount of value out of Finerac in a key you know, number of modules were valuable for them, but they didn't need to use everything. And then in their case, and I, I don't think this, yeah, the, the format I had here doesn't accurately depict all the different external solutions they have, but their end-to-end -end solution is widespread and encompassing. And Finerac as a loan management system of record was just one component of it. And then next up is looking at the high-level diagram for a neobank. And so this is a neobank just focused on providing uh, transactional accounts and so not providing lending. Fairly similar to the diagram for the first user there. And then once again, you know, they're primarily building out their solution with more uh, items around the core itself. So you can see they've got their whole customer onboarding. They've built out a suite of tools around customer support and engagement, and then building out what they need around actual movement of money. And then lastly, you know, this is sort of like the original target user of Finerac, a microfinance institution, or in this case, I called out Asako, so it could show how they use the share accounts. But here you can see, you know, they're utilizing most of those modules within the core because they do need sort of a standalone system that might not be robust in all these areas, but it provides the capabilities that they need. And then typically, you know, an entity like Asako in East Africa or Western Africa they're going to need an integration with like a mobile money rail. They might have a self-service mobile banking app, and they're going to need some type of decisioning for their lending, but they're often not building out a lot of solutions around the core itself. I've got one last category of our presentation. So next up, it's around the rules and playbooks. So now that we've seen sort of what that boundary is of the playing field, and we've seen what sits beyond the core, I want to talk about how we can you know, establish a common set of rules and operating norms for our community such that we can attract as many you know, players to the table, but as many attendees to the crowd itself. So first off, I want to establish how important that virtuous cycle is. And that's a key message we try to emphasize, especially to all of our commercial adopters in the community, where by contributing back to the common core, you know, they benefit what everyone gets. So this is in terms of new innovation, maintenance, quality control. So this aspect of the virtuous cycle I just want to establish. And so a key challenge for us is being able to incentivize this upstream contribution. So we need to balance, you know, the ability to contribute back to the core with that opportunity to commercialize. So within the core itself, we want to make, you know, the boundaries of it large enough such that it's relevant and valuable to others but we don't want to define or build out everything such that there is no ability to differentiate. But I think as we've seen from the previous slides in terms of what sits around the core, that we still have a lot in which we need common contributions to, but there's still tremendous areas of opportunity to actually differentiate. So we want to balance these two sides of the coin. And so one key part I wanted to go back to before we sort of establish the importance of defining these rules and norms is first off, you know, we need to understand like who are the players and then what are their playbooks. And so within our commercial ecosystem, I categorize the, the players as being those service providers and integrators. And so in terms of how this maps to the beyond the core, they might be building new bespoke integrations or they might be, you know, creating an enterprise level integration with one of those layers. And then our next category of player in our ecosystem are these end-to-end -end solution providers. So sometimes they might be providing the core plus all these ancillary components and they could be delivering this as a banking SaaS solution or it could be a banking as a service solution as well. And then we also have providers who are fintechs or others who are building a complete solution where they need Finract as that core financial engine, but as part of their overall solution, they need to build beyond the core. And then lastly, we have those who might be wanting to integrate their existing solution so if I'm an ID or a payment provider, it behooves me to build a connector to Finerac because I can access that entire user base of Finerac users. 
And so the last point here, I've got one more slide after this, is the common set of rules. So we want to make sure that everybody is adhering to and wanting to contribute back upstream. They know and understand the Apache way, and that they try to follow and abide by our coding standards and what we've defined as our definition of done. And then around the business rules, we want to make clear you know, why to contribute upstream, but we also want to make sure they're aware of those playbooks that I put on the previous screen of how beyond the core you can differentiate. And then, yeah, lastly here, oh, go. No. <laughs> Just one second. OK. Yeah, so the main takeaway here, we've seen how large the playing field is. We've seen how expansive the beyond the core and the additional solutions you can build. But I think the key takeaway here is that although there are all these different playbooks in which you can succeed commercially, everybody must follow this common set of rules to contribute back upstream and to collaborate with others in the community. So that's the main takeaway there. And then... Yeah, lastly here, in terms of how you can get in touch with me or how you can take action or get involved. So you've seen there are a number of areas where we need contribution upstream, areas that are key parts of our roadmap. There's an area in which you can build new solutions that are leveraging you know, these components, or you could build solutions that integrate with these components. Or if you have one of these third-party solutions and want to integrate it with Finerac, we very much welcome that. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Hopefully you found this informative, and I think this will be a good framework or a means of discussion for a community moving forward. So. Yeah, if you have any questions afterwards, I can attend to them. So.